Good evening. I'm Anthony Austin, Director of Wilmette Public Library. Welcome to tonight's feature event with Charles Yu, author of the 2020 National Book Award winning novel, Interior Chinatown, the 2021 selection for our signature programming series, One Book Everyone Reads, sponsored by the Friends of the Wilmette Public Library. We're delighted that you have joined us from near and far. Before we begin, a few details about how tonight's program will proceed. During the first part of tonight's program, author Charles Yu will speak in conversation with librarian Amy Barrow. The conversation will be followed by a Q&A led by librarian Barbara Goodman. We are using Zoom webinar for tonight's event. This means that as an attendee, you can see and hear us, the panelists, but we cannot see or hear you, the attendees. If you have a question for Charles, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to type your question there. The icon looks like two overlapping conversation bubbles. Barbara will get to as many of those questions as time permits. If you haven't yet read Interior Chinatown, contact Wilmette Public Library or your own local library to borrow a copy. If you're interested in purchasing a copy of the book, please support the Bookstall, our local independent bookstore. You can locate the Bookstall's contact information by visiting the library's webpage about tonight's event. Hailed for his sharp wit and incisive social commentary, Charles Yu is an acclaimed author and screenwriter whose work is as inventive as it is moving. Interior Chinatown, his fourth and most recent novel, is at once a satirical meditation on immigration, assimilation, and Hollywood stereotyping of Asian Americans, and a touching portrait of a family. A National Book Award winner and a most anticipated book by Entertainment Weekly, Time, The Rumpus, and others, Interior Chinatown follows the story of Willis Wu, who has been cast in the role of generic Asian man in the ongoing procedural cop show, Black and White, as he struggles to transcend the rigid and reductive roles available to those who look like him. Both extensively researched and startlingly original, Interior Chinatown is a profound and topical exploration of the weight of stereotypes, racism, and assimilation in American culture. Yu's previous novel, How to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe, was a New York Times notable book and a Time Top 10 fiction book of 2010. Yu is the recipient of the National Book Foundation's Five Under 35 Award, and he was nominated for two Writers Guild of America Awards for his screenwriting work on the HBO series Westworld. In addition to writing for Westworld, Yu has been on writing staffs for shows on FX, AMC, Facebook Watch, and Adult Swim. His fiction and nonfiction have appeared in a number of publications, including The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, Wired, Time, and Plowshares. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our special guest, Charles Yu, in conversation with librarian Amy Barrow. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. And we're so excited you're here this evening. We're just thrilled that you accepted our invitation and um, we have so much we'd like to know about your novel. Um, So let's start. Interior Chinatown is a family story. Can you start by telling us about you and your family and what led you to becoming a novelist? Sure. Um, Well, I guess my parents, they immigrated from Taiwan, they're Taiwanese, and they came to the US in the 60s. Um, And I was born and raised in Los Angeles, um, and have and still live in Southern California now with my wife and our two children who are 13 and 11. Uh, In fact, just before this, I was at online orientation for daughter who starts high school in the fall, which is sort of, it's like impossible to believe. I don't know if other parents out there have this feeling of, I just, you know, feels like a time warp, but, um, and yeah, in, in many ways, you know, I think I've always written about family. Sometimes, um, that subject is wrapped in sci-fi or layers of other sort of speculative genre, um, kind of, uh, rapping, but in this case, it was, um, uh, I, I had always wanted to write about immigration and assimilation, um, you know, weaving in some of the stories that my parents had told me about what it was like when they first came to the U.S. and 
uh, you know, tried to raise the fam their family. And, um, and so that's really, you know, was the kind of seed of the story is wanting to tell, to tell about some of their experiences and imagine it from, from their perspective. Good. And so what inspired you to actually write Interior Chinatown after your earlier novel? Right. Um, so, you know, my earlier novel, just to very briefly set the stage, is a time travel story. Um, it's called How to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe. Um, I don't know if it's at the Wilmette Public Library, but, uh, oh, it is. Good. <laughs> um, uh, it's a father-son story um, about a guy, the father, who invents a form of time travel in his garage you know, with his son's help and ends up using the machine to sort of get lost in time in his own past. And so the son uh, has to go back and look for his dad, basically in his own childhood. Um, and after I'd written that book, I wrote another, or I published another short story collection. And when I was on tour for that book, uh, I had a reader come up to me at a signing and say, why do you think that you have sort of shied away from writing about, you know, um, racial experiences in a direct way. And my initial reaction was denial. You know, I was like, uh, have I? You know, I mean, not, not to the reader, but just sort of internally, it, it kind of created this dissonance with me where I, I was surprised by that comment. And also it just caused me to do some soul searching. And so, I think eventually I came to the conclusion that there was a part of me that was sort of afraid to tell a story explicitly about, you know, about um, being a child of immigrants, being, you know, feeling marginalized and, and, and wanting to really talk about that, but not knowing how to do it, you know, as you pointed out, I had written earlier books that were sort of generally in a sci-fi or speculative kind of uh, realm. And, and um, for a long time, I worried that I didn't really have the tools to tell this kind of story. And so part of what took so long was me trying to figure out how to do it in a way that matched those tools, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, what do you hope that your readers gain from this novel? Um, well, I hope, first of all, it's a good reading experience. I mean, I read to uh, laugh and feel and think uh, in some order. Um, and so the whole time I was writing it, I just kept thinking, what are people going to think of this? Will they Will they like the form? Will they understand sort of how the form is, for me anyway, kind of revealing things about the content of the story itself? Um, and more than anything, I, I wanted to give a subjective inner life to characters who often don't have that, you know? I mean, um, and specifically in this case, the, the sort of background Asians who are normally relegated to you know, feeling like they get to be in the Chinatown special episode, but they don't get to be the main characters of the story. I wanted to put the reader very, you know, very sort of viscerally in the, in the mind and body of this guy, Willis Wu, and say, here's what it's like to be the guy in the background who you don't think about too often. So interesting. Um... You've written for Westworld and other TV shows. Was it always your intention to write Interior Chinatown in the form of a screenplay? Um, it was not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> in fact, uh, when I kind of realized that this is, it's, it's a weird way to say it, when I realized this is what I was doing, but that is sort of what happened, is I had tried a couple of times to write this book in very different forms and they just weren't working. You know, anyone out there who's watching, you know, if you've tried to write or create something, you, you just, 
sometimes you, at least for me, sometimes you feel like you have tapped into something real and sometimes you sort of know you're faking it. <laughs> and for a long time, I felt like I was faking it. I just had not found the right form. And when the screenplay format sort of, I don't know, presented itself, I resisted it at first, but it, it just eventually, I realized that it, it sort of had to be this way. But that was after working on Westworld and a couple of other shows. So I think what happened was uh, it took time for that idea to sort of filter through my subconscious and sort of emerge as like, oh, try this, you know? Um, so, you know, in that kind of mysterious way, it's like, why, why did it happen when it did? Why did it take so long? I, I don't know. <laughs> Understandable. Um, well, we wondered how did the novel change during your process of revising it and how long did the whole, you know, start to finish for the novel take? Yes, uh, it took a long time, <laughs> the short answer. <laughs> Um, and I and I actually enjoy talking about this, you know, for two reasons. One, because it's in the past now, and I don't have to re <laughs> I don't have to redo it. Um, and two, because you know, for writers and readers, I I don't know. I I hope it's a, if if not instructive, at least uh, you know um, of some use to to realize. Uh, how slow some people can be. Uh, so I, and, and so it, from start to finish, I would say it took almost seven years to write the book. Uh, and it's not a very long book for the, <laughs> for, for people that have read it, uh, that I calculated it's something like 20 words a day, which is sort of depressing when you think about <laughs> it that way. Um, yeah, like all those years, I could have literally written two sentences down, <laughs> called it a day, and I would have ended up in the same place. Um, I, I think, you know, part of the reason it took so long was, as I mentioned, I, I wrote it a couple of times in a way that just didn't work. And so I had to scrap those, you know, my editor uh, and my agent were, were reading the early drafts. They were the only people reading it at that point. And, you know, they never explicitly told me this is not working, but we could all sort of feel it. And so I had to go back to the drawing board. Um, and, you know, I, there were many times in that in those years where I just really questioned, one, is this worth finishing? And two, um, you know, uh, even if I finish it, will it connect with anyone? So um, I don't know, I'm not sure. I, I think I may have missed the question a little bit, but. No, that's great. Um, we have, we did read that you did wanna give up on it and your wife convinced you to keep going. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, she did. Uh, <laughs> She, she's, um, among other things, um, you know, a very level-headed person who also knows my temperament better than I do. And so I think she knows how to sort of wait the right amount of time and then tell me to get back to it. Mm -hmm. It's very important. Uh, cause I, I think I probably would have stopped. Um, good. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the first line, ever since you were a boy, you've dreamt of being Kung Fu and why you decided to repeat that often throughout the novel? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, the first line um, was one of those moments where it, it just did feel like, oh, I had cracked open something, you know, I didn't know yet where I was going, but it felt like I could hear the voice of Willis. I could, um, I, I had a sort of built into that sentence or even is a kind of journey for, you know, the character is here's a starting point. Here's something that he's always dreamed of. And what are we going to see in this story? Is he going to go for his dream? Um, in terms of repetition, um, you know, I love when things rhyme, you know, in that way, I think, uh, like a song or a piece of music or, you know, a film that has that kind of visual analog to that when, for me, there's something very circular about Willis's existence, at least at the beginning. And, and so I really wanted to kind of convey that 
um, in, a, in a structural way. So the early parts of the book really feel like this is a guy who wakes up every day kind of in a groundhog day way, you know, of like, I got to go to work. My job is to be generic Asian man. And how do I break out of this cycle? So um, as a refrain, it, it helped, you know, and, and yet built into that line too is a kind of hope, right? I mean, there's a, there's a hope that there's something better for him out there, so. Good. Well, it was a great line. Um, what was the research process like for Interior Chinatown? And was it different than, I haven't read your um, short stories or the other novel, but just wondering what the process was like. Um, the process was uh, fun. I, I have never really done research uh, prior to this. I, I guess for uh, the time travel story, I did a little bit of um, research on on like the physics of time travel, you know, if, if it were to occur, how, how could it? And so, but that was more just fun reading. This, I sort of had to, I wanted to incorporate certain you know, bits about history of Asian Americans, you know, legally, um, sort of what has their status been? And so in parts of the book, there are these court cases that talk about, um, you know, the fight through the judicial system to secure certain rights. Um, and, and so there, there was some research there. It, it also drew upon my legal background because you know, I, I, I was a lawyer for many years. I went to law school and I practiced. So I, I felt like at least I put some use to my law school tuition and all those years of paying my dues. Good. Um, the memoir section about Willis's parents was so affecting, were so affecting. Um, have you thought about expanding those sections into another work at some point? Um, that's a great question. Um, and I actually have, yeah, I mean, I think you, uh, uh, intuited something it, it, at one point I had spent a lot of time interviewing my parents and I sort of imagined that, um, I imagine two things that I still dream about a little bit, which it, which are, and I actually haven't talked about this out loud, so it's weird to say it and now in front of lots of people, um, is a larger project where I interviewed, you know, people of their cohort, or I found other people's accounts and collected them um, and sort of collected them into, you know, um, a work of nonfiction, you know, to, to, and, and see what that might be. Um, and that's, so I obtained their, some of their life stories kind of under false pretenses because that's what they thought that they were contributing to when, when I was interviewing them. Of course, I had heard a lot of these stories just growing up, but we did the formal thing where I sat them down and said, I'm going to hit record, you know, please talk to me about your life for as long as you, you know, you, you're willing to do so. And, and um, so, yeah, it's still kind of out there as a dream. That would be great. Um, are there plans for a screen version of this book? Uh, there are plans. I am working on it. Um, there is a network, you know, Hulu, which is, you know, uh, they, it's, I guess, set up there for me to adapt it. And, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean it'll be on the air. It, it's really up to me if I can figure out how to make it into a compelling show, uh, then hopefully they'll put it on the air. But for now, I have the opportunity to try to write uh, the script for, you know, and, and we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great position to be in. So um, we wondered how the hardcover cover came about, and then they did change it. I don't have the paper back here with me, but <laughs> right there, yeah. Yeah. So we wondered if, you know, were you involved in that and um, and the changes that they made for the paperback cover, if you could tell us about that. Um, I 
was not involved until they'd basically come up with the design, you mm -hmm. know, and then they do solicit input. Um, but they had for the hardcover, I remember when I first saw it, I was, um, you know, I loved it. I thought it was really kind of uh, bold and uh, it just conveyed so much, you know, and even down to the sort of like the aging, the, the, the paper they used and how they sort of tried to make it look almost distressed. You know, um, if you can see some of there's like some smearing and at first I thought it was an error, but there's like some color bleeding too. And then I realized it was on multiple copies of it. And, um, and, you know, there was a little bit of uh, input just in terms of like asking my parents to be honest like does this you know how do you feel about this you know is this um weird to you uh and you know i think they loved it as well and then with the paperback um i think the goal because the hardcover had gone over so well in terms of the cover the goal was to do a version of it like sometimes you see it's a pretty different between hardcover and paperback mm -hmm. here. It feels like a softer, maybe slightly more approachable version of the hardcover. And I think that's really smart because, you know, in general, that's what the paperback is. Right. And so, um, uh, so yeah, I, I just, I thought it was so clever. And I think that's such an interesting art and craft that cover designers have of like, how do you visually interpret a whole novel in like sort of, you know, one image. Right, right. They're both great covers. Um, so I wondered how your life has changed since you've won the National Book Award. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I guess on the one hand, completely. And on the other hand, not at all. You know, like even that night, because it was all virtual, we, my family and I, we just turned off the computer and ate pizza, <laughs> you know, like it was, it's great. I was, you know, changed into my, my uh, t-shirt and shorts within minutes. And so that was great. And same with kind of the writing routine and daily life because of the pandemic. I mean, we just, I haven't even really, um, like I haven't gotten to see the book in libraries. That's like something I'm really itching to do is go to a library, go to stores and see it because honestly it was hard to find before the award. So that's great. I mean, that's the biggest change is mm -hmm. the book found so many more readers and that's just incredible. And I, I feel really fortunate. And the other way is, you know, having a series of conversations like the one we're having now. And that is in many ways, like the thing I fear most, but also why I write is the whole time, all those years I'm writing the book, I imagine basically this moment of like, people have read the book and now I get to talk to someone about it. I get to talk to you about it. And um, and yeah, so I'm really grateful for that because a lot of books get published, as you know, and uh, prior to the award, it's sort of like, you know, the book is out for, for and then for a couple of weeks, there's a little attention and then silence so <laughs> I get a longer period before the silence <laughs> well that leads into our next question which was that you were lucky that interior Chinatown came out in January of 2020 so you got to have a little bit of a of a book tour in person and how much did that change and how difficult was it when everything went virtual kind of in the middle of that Right. Um, yeah, it, I, I was just looking back at old emails right around that time and realizing how little, like, you know, I think I knew, but also the whole world knew about like what was to come. It's just funny how naive. So I was like, oh, this is being canceled. I wonder, I wonder if these things in April will get canceled, you know, like, and here we are in April of the next year. Um, um, but yes, I was, really lucky because I got to do the physical book tour in January and very early February. And now looking back, I realized, you know, I'd flown to New York and I'd done an event in San Francisco. Like here I am on a plane 
I was like shaking people's hands. I mean, <laughs> my wife at one point was like, why are you shaking people's hands? Like that, that's already weird. Like you don't have to shake everyone's hand, but it's just a thing that I have always done at readings. And then I was like, yeah, I should probably stop that. And, and so that was, I hope I, I mean, I probably shouldn't even admit that, that I was doing that, but, um, but yeah, it, it, it became, it, the beginning of the pandemic coincided with basically the end of the tour. So it was already when I was going to, you know, kind of have a drop off, except for kind of a couple of festivals later on. And then as everything got canceled, um, it, it, yeah, it became a lot of news watching. And then I started to write, you know, nonfiction stuff during the year. Um, and so that was taking up my time, but mostly it was just watching along with the whole world of like, what is happening? Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. Um, well, the National Book Award really catapulted you onto the national scene. And given that, and in this era of rising hate crimes against Asian Americans, do you feel an increased obligation or a desire to be a spokesperson for the AAPI community? Um, I feel not a desire. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a, a real anxiety about one, you know, am I qualified? Do I want to, um, am I articulate or informed enough about, you know, certain topics, history, the state of things right now. Um, and if I have the opportunity or if, if I take an opportunity to, to speak publicly or write something, am I doing so at the expense of someone who might be better positioned to, to you know, be a voice? Um, so these are all things that kind of go into my calculus of like, when people ask, would you write something or do you want to talk about this on a panel, uh, whether or not it's worthwhile, I, I, I feel certainly a kind of responsibility since I'm lucky enough to have this platform for however long it lasts, you know, to, to speak when I, when I do feel like I can be additive, but um, that that's probably a pretty sharply diminishing curve, you know, for like at some point I've said, pretty much the three things I know how to say. And I, I sort of would love to find ways to amplify voices of people, for instance, working in actual community organizations or people who are better versed about, you know, the policy or, you know, um, history who might be able to actually move the ball forward in the conversation. But, you know, I think my, to me, the best way I can be useful is to tell stories. So you know, at some point I should probably like stop, <laughs> stop being any kind of public voice and just get back to telling a story that, that may, you know, specifically, let's say with this series, you know, for Interior Chinatown, if that becomes a series that potentially could reach thousands or even millions of people, you know, and, you know, what kind of opportunity, that's a huge opportunity potentially. So um, to, change people's perceptions or to uh yeah reframe narratives so yeah well you're certainly well positioned to write that um so i think we'll have one more question and then move on to the audience questions um in interior chinatown you frequently quote sociologist irving goffman and we wondered why why you did that in the book so often Right. Um, I, I think because I find his ideas really powerful and I sort of, uh, and in, for this book, I don't know if it's a chicken, it's a chicken and egg thing, you know, did I write this book because of his ideas or did I have this idea? And then I realized how, you know, applicable his framework was, but, but basically, you know, for those who may not be familiar, he, he, you know, has this book, um, called the presentation of self in everyday life, in which he uh, uh, sets out a kind of dr dramaturgical theory of social life. Right, that a lot of what we do in social situations 
is a kind of performance in which we're playing roles, we're acting as both sort of actors, but also audience members at the same time. And, um, you know, I, I discovered his work 20 years ago or so. And I think <laughs> I basically wrote a bunch of short stories where I try to steal his ideas and smuggle them into fiction. And so this book in a lot of ways is just the culmination of me, you know, uh, being influenced by, by that framework in particular. So when I realized that I could epigraph, you know, a bunch of his best lines into the book, uh, I got very excited. Then I worried, it's like, how much can I get away with before? It's like, it feels weird that I'm just stealing lines from this guy. <laughs> oh, it's really interesting. Well, thank you so much for all your time and for all the insights you've given us. And I know we could talk for longer, but there are a lot of audience questions. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Barbara Goodman, who will handle the Q&A. Barb? Thank you, Amy. Hi there. Well, that was really wonderful. And to no one's surprise, we have lots of questions from our audience. So let's get started. Um, the first one, there's actually been a number of questions about something that you touched on in your talk with Amy, when you talked about um, that your experience with Westworld and other TV shows uh, helped you in terms of writing the book in a screenplay format. But can you elaborate on that a little bit more and how you felt that the format or how the, how the story led itself to the format and how it was then writing that? Sure, yeah, thanks. Um, well, um, it's funny because I don't, uh, uh, I don't wanna make it sound more intentional than, than it was. I think that for me, the danger in a retrospective like analysis of how an idea came to be is always a kind of fiction, you know, because, in the moment, it is much more chaotic and piecemeal than, um, than I'm going to make it sound. But that's with that disclaimer, I'll, I'll give the short answer or semi-short, uh, which would be that um, I, you know, the, the first thing that came was Willis Wu's voice. You know, the lines that, that Amy quoted, the, the first lines of the book about ever since you were a boy. Um, so once I realized that I, or I got excited about the idea of Willis as the voice and that really shifted the whole book because prior to that, I had been telling the story from this very kind of removed third person perspective. And once I had Willis's voice, um, it felt much more first person. It felt subjective and interior. And that's what I was looking for. Um, and then, when I realized, okay, if he wants to be Kung Fu guy, then he's an actor. And if he's an actor, what kind of show is he on? And if he's in a show, um, could, the, could the novel be in the form of a script? Because the thing that the script really gave me was a very easy visual way for us to see that Willis exists inside this constructed narrative but he's an individual kind of straining against his prescribed role. And without the script, without us seeing, okay, this looks like a screenplay, every time I drop in or out of Willis's head, I have to sort of do some kind of explanation or transition. But with that, I get a much more sort of efficient and unstated kind of, um, uh, result, which is that the reader gets to experience what it's like to be Willis, to, to feel like he's trapped in this show. And, and so th that's really, uh, I said that would be the short answer, but that was, that's my answer. I should stop now. Well, you handled it remarkably because I think the reader definitely caught on to what you were intending. Um, and the same token in terms of uh, structure of the book, what inspired you to set the book up as you did in terms of interior and exterior Chinatowns? Right. Um, you know, it, it was one of those things where um, 
it started from this feeling of like, when I enter, when I, the Latin, you know, the novels I love most are the ones where it feels like from page one, I've dropped into this, someone's head. You know, I think, um, I almost feel like it's like I've been dropped into an, like there's an envelope around me and what I, what I am now in is someone else's consciousness. So I still have my own brain, but I'm getting to see through someone else's, you know, um, like, like it's a scrim. I'm getting to see through someone else's consciousness. And to me that, that interiority was, um, the key to making Willis, you know, a full-fledged human as opposed to generic Asian man. Um, and so I thought, well, that it's kind of a pun, right? I mean, in screenplays, you write interior blank, right? Interior family room, interior, whatever office. Um, and I thought, well, I guess the journey is for Willis to figure out how does he go from interior to exterior? But I didn't know what that meant at first, you know, that kind of developed over the course of the story. Um, and, you know, I, I think, yeah, I, I think I think that was really it. I, I just, it felt like such a um, simple yet like universal arc of like, here's a guy who's trapped in a situation, how's he gonna get out of it? Mm -hmm. Um, let's see another so one of our audience members says interior Chinatown seems to aim at dispelling stereotypes of Chinese or Asian Americans by thoroughly indulging in them. Don't many of the stereotypes in your novel harken back more to the era of Charlie Chan than to the 21st century? Yeah, um, that's a fair question. and I appreciate it. Um, they do. I mean, I think there's um, I think there's two parts of that that I'd like to address. One, do they indulge in the stereotypes? Um, uh, you know, certainly I think a reasonable reader could feel like, I, do I need to rehash this or is it harmful to kind of um, see all these again? You know, like, is this, and for me, it was, you know, just in the writing of it, I, I can only describe what it felt like to sort of list them, you know? I mean, in the early parts of the book, I basically just list a bunch of kind of uh, really caricatures or, or incredibly limiting roles that Asians have been kind of relegated to over the decades. Um, I think in some ways that connection with a past era that in that we you could argue were were beyond that now, it was important to me because I don't think we're actually beyond it. I think I think that um, the names change. You know, the roles have gotten maybe a little bit more nuanced, but we largely still don't see. Um, I don't see a a a p i characters on TV as fully dimensional humans. We don't see a lot of narratives that center completely in their experience. So that goes, I, I think, again, to the circularity of the of the structure of the novel, which is, you know, Willis, even as things feel like they've changed, some things haven't changed. And sadly, I think this is actually playing out as we're seeing the violence and harassment. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, definitely, sadly. Uh, can you talk a little about the father in the story? He was so powerful and so moving. Is the character based on anyone in your life? Thanks. Um, you know, I think the inspiration is from my own dad, um, the, the old Asian man and young Asian man's uh, experiences, um, the draw upon um, some of my own, you know, yeah, my own father's life experiences, um, a, as a kind of emotional seed. There are bits of biography in there too. I mean, my, my dad actually did go to Mississippi when he first arrived. Um, 
that's where he lived and studied for a while. Um, and I think from from there, of course, you know, layers of fiction get applied to it, and it eventually grows into a character that's quite different. But you know, I think um, the DNA of who that character is uh, was important to me. Is is um, somebody who uh, really, in so many ways, tried to understand the system that he was entering and try to figure out all of the invisible rules and play by them and figure that through achievement and good manners and um, you know he he would basically blend in and, and so and I think the 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 realization later in life of um, that that could only take him so far and the disappointment that comes with that um, is something important for uh, Willis, I think, especially to, to see, so. Uh, so I had read that you studied molecular biology in college and you didn't uh, talk about that earlier this evening but you did talk about becoming a lawyer. So can you tell us a little bit how you made the transition from becoming a, a student of molecular biology to a lawyer and then to a writer? Sure. Uh, it's easy. You, <laughs> a simple <laughs> path. Uh, you, in my case, uh, the key was to be not that great at molecular biology. Uh, so my career options were pretty limited coming out of college. Um, you know, I really studied it mostly to make my parents happy. Uh, I, I think they were hoping I'd be a doctor. Um, it, alas, it did not work out for me. Uh, medical school didn't want me to be a doctor. And uh, so I went to law school um, thinking that, you know, well, I like to read and write. And being a lawyer seems like a lot of reading and writing. Um, uh, but, you know, all along the way, I was... I was, I don't know that I like dreamt of being a writer um, as my job, but I always, you know, kept my love of books and, um, and fiction specifically. And so I think that part of my education, both in terms of like biology and the law, for me, all of it is actually really still part of, um, it's, it's, it's like, I don't compartmentalize that part of my life or education from my writing, you know, it, it all kind of mushes together uh, and <laughs> for better or worse. Well, the law part served you well, clearly in the part of the book at the trial. Right. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Uh, the novel is written uh, primarily in the second person point of view. Did you consider writing the novel in either the first or the third person? And why did you choose second? And what did you feel were the strengths or the reasons primarily why you, why you did that? Right. Um, I did consider both uh, for a long time. Um, I think my first inclination was first person. So actually when that line came out, this is part of the sort of the revisionist history that I was talking about. When the li line actually came out, it was, ever since I was a boy, I dreamt of being Kung Fu guy. And the structure of the line is largely the same, but it sounds different to my, you know, it, it sounded a little bit off to my ear. And it, it wasn't something I could put my finger on at first. Um, I just had a nagging sense that it wasn't right. So then I tried the book. At that point, the book was something like 50 pages, but I, I tried it in third person. And that sounded even worse, but I thought, well, I know first isn't right. Maybe I'm just not good enough at third person. So I, I sort of worked with that. Um, and then I developed a very sophisticated form of procrastination where I would just switch between first and third person for several hours and convince myself that that was productive work. Um, and during that time, uh, a little voice inside of me was saying, try second person. But 
I, I tamped down that voice, you know, I, I was like, no, don't try a second, but that's, don't do that. You're already writing the book in the form of a screenplay. Second person is just like a bridge too far. People are not going to follow you on that journey. Um, but the voice persists, persisted. And I think the voice was right. I only realized this, I think later when I had to articulate almost like a preemptive defense, because I was anticipating that my editor might say, why is this book in second person? <laughs> Don't do that. Um, so what I came up with uh, was the reason it sounds better in second is one, it gives Willis less agency. You know, I think there's something about him being narrated too, um, at least in the beginning parts of the book that felt intuitively right. And, and actually, when you just read them, you're saying, oh, okay, he's not in control of the story. Um, I think, I hope that that the you, you know, also becomes a little more fluid and expansive as the book goes on so that as Willis does sort of grow out of his role and try to transcend the boundaries of, of, his, of his, you know, background part, um, he, the second person kind of grows with him a little bit, you know, it, it almost you can imagine that he is the one narrating at times. Um, and I think the last thing is it, it was the most immediate way to thrust the reader into Willis's shoes to say, okay, this is, you know, if it's almost like a video game, it's like, you are now in control of this character. Um, so, yeah. Those are, I just wrote like, that. that's me writing a little mini paper on my own book, I guess. Keep it up, I love it, that's fantastic. <laughs> uh, this question, this was a timely, starting with a comment, this was a timely consciousness raising book to read. I like the blurring between fact and fantasy, internal and external worlds. I also like your description of the life, of life and memory in the book. Um, saying that we create memories and then relive memories. Do you think this parallels the life living experiences of those who experience life as other or as outsiders? And what is required to live in the United States? Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, I, I hadn't thought about it in that specific way. Um, that line about, you know, you go through, you know, your life sort of uh, chasing, essentially sort of chasing this, your greatest memories, you know, living a few years in this kind of oblivious bliss and then spending the rest of your life uh, looking for that again. Um, th there's, uh, I mean, that's me as a dad, basically. <laughs> I'm constantly in in this dual consciousness of like watching my kids and being with them at the same time and just like toggling between those two things of like i'm gonna miss this <laughs> and like and th sometimes they catch me doing it, like stop doing that you know like just be here with us and don't you don't have to do the voiceover for this experience right now um uh so i feel like on one level i hope it's universal you know i i, I hope among the other roles willis plays besides being a generic Asian man, he gets to be a dad, you know, he gets to be a, a romantic partner, he gets to be a son. And uh, I think those roles are all as much a part of what's important to Willis's journey as the racial part of it, you know, that I, I hope that, you know, anyone who has felt like they are not the center of a story could identify with certain parts of this. That said, I think implicit in the comment is this idea, and I th there's something really interesting about it, that if you are, you know, part of a historically marginalized group, you might have uh, that kind of feeling might have extra resonance to you because you're used to sort of not thinking unconscious or not living unconsciously as the center of action. You're more used to observing other people's life, so. You know, I think that's interesting, yeah. Perfect. Uh, you talked about your your dad earlier and, or in the father, relative to the father in the story. Uh, 
another uh, viewer wants to know if there's anything or anything else in this case, autobiographical in the book. Um, some of uh, Dorothy Wu's experiences are also based like on a seed of biograph biography. Um, my mom did go to Alabama. Um, that was the first. So both my parents ended up in the South somehow. That's not where they met, but um, they met through like mutual friends. And the way that my dad quartered my mom was like he wrote her letters, which I think is so amazing. Like, you know, um, but uh, that that's it. <laughs> you know, from there, similar with Old Asian Man, I think there's a lot of fiction that gets applied. Um, and certainly none of Willis, like I, I, I guess the one tangent point of Willis to my real life is my brother, actually, my younger brother is an actor. He's an actor and a writer. So, you know, it draws a little bit upon his experience as well, but like he didn't, he's nothing like Willis. I don't want to make that, I would hate to, to he's a much more confident and successful person than, than Willis. Can you explain your choice to use black and white as the TV series underlying the novel? Sure. Um, I mean, on one level, I was looking for, uh, you know, the construct, the most rigid construct. And where my head went was Law and Order. You know, it's like very famous, uh, very much a template of like, how do you make a show that can continue to spin out <laughs> spin-off series and and I feel like people recognize oh the a police procedural that's a kind of contemporary form of story that we all rec that a lot of people recognize and the title is on the nose but it also was sort of too good to pass up I was like I literally can imagine this being a title even though it seems a little corny um it, you know it was, it started almost as a placeholder, like I'll come up with something better. And then as it went on, I was like, I don't think so. I think I'm just going to call it black and white. Uh, it, 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 yeah, points it a little in the direction of, okay, this is a little bit elevated. This isn't quite supposed to be real, like a real show, but you know, I could imagine a version of black and white being on TV at least maybe 20 years ago. I think we have time for two more questions. Uh, can you talk a little about how you develop the SRO as a location, as well as the SRO residents? The location and the people living there were a big part of the book, though often as a group chorus, but when their individual stories came to the forefront, they were often moving, like the one about the father who waited for his son's call and then died in the shower. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, um, the... I guess, you know, it, it started with this idea of um, where would they live? You know, where would the background Asians live? And I, I imagined a kind of conflation of a bunch of things. Like, do they live in, um, you know, like corp, not dorms, but like, d does like, are they bust somewhere as extras or, or something like that? And then I was like, well, I think it, I think there's actually a historical precedent. They would probably live above where they work. You know, that's that in, in these kinds of buildings where people actually live. And so, um, and something about the, um, the, both the kind of, you know, somewhat cramped quarters, but also the, uh, I guess the feeling of this density and community, even despite that, I wanted to create you know, a kind of happy version of the SRO, even if it wasn't necessarily historically accurate, this idea that they would find, you know, comfort and community with each other. And so I imagine this scene of like them basically having these tiny rooms, but life is lived um, very much in the hallways and the common areas. Excellent. Um... Uh, I read that you recently started a scholarship fund for young writers, and we're wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Yes, I um, 
together with an organization called TaiwaneseAmerican.org, uh, we started a writing prize for high school and college students. Um, and the idea is, you know, it's the, the requirements are there at the website, but the idea was, you know, when I was growing up, um, there were programs like camps I went to and um, internships, and they were mostly geared towards, you know, uh, either like sort of politics or leadership or that sort of thing. Not a lot in the way of like creative and the arts. And, you know, I, you know, just felt like it would be great to maybe build, foster a kind of infrastructure or community around, you know, a prize. So yes, there'll be winners and, and runners up and that's really exciting. But really what I'm excited to do is get the chance to read the work of these young writers and, um, you know, get to meet them and talk to them and, and see what they're interested in and hope that the, you know, if they, if they have access to something like this and a place for them to gather, they'll maybe continue telling stories or, you know, become avid readers and really just um, continue to support reading and books that way. So. That sounds like a lucky group of young people and who you're certainly inspiring just of you as you've inspired all of us. Uh, we really want to thank you for your time tonight and of course for sharing your writing with the world. Uh, this has been a delightful and enlightening evening. I'm sure I'm not alone when I say that I cannot wait to see what you do next. Uh, we want to thank all of you who have come tonight uh, for this program and also all of you who have uh, been here for other parts of the One Book Everyone Reads series. Uh, we're thrilled to have had you with us. Please watch for a follow-up library, a follow-up email from the library that will include a link to the website where you'll find more information about Charles and about the book. And the link will also guide you to, to a recording of tonight's program in case you want to rewatch it or share it with others. Uh, finally, we'd really appreciate it if you would take our short survey, which will be linked in the follow-up email and will also be available on the screen at the end of tonight's event. With that, many thanks again to Charles. Many thanks again to all of you for coming. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. Good night. Right. Thank you so much. <laughs>